Good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. This is Rebecca Jernigan coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, journeying into the realms of the known and the unknown. You're listening and watching to Journeys with Rebecca right here on Project Camelot TV Network. Good evening, everyone. Tonight is really going to be a fantastic guest. You, none other has been like him before. His name is Harvey Kraft. He is the author of The Buddha from Babylon. Now, this book is a, a truly a profound narrative that explores the evolution of civilization, the world's interconnected spiritual roots, the quest for enlightenment, and an eye-opening new look at the historical Buddha. I invite everyone now to join in on um, Mr. Harvey Kraft's uh, website, and that's BuddhaFromBabylon.com. That's BuddhaFromBabylon.com. You can go in there and check that out. Now, according to some information here, the Buddha may have been the very first psychologist. His model for the human mind included an individual, shared, and universal mind. Freud suggested the, his nirvana principle and focusing on the individual, Jung on the collective mind, transpersonal psychology on the cosmic mind, and integral psychology, reflects the Buddha's threefold integration. When the three minds are in balance and our universal values are in charge, our individual shared in cosmic self functions in harmony. So, with this, we're going to now invite Harvey onto the show. Welcome, Harvey. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the invitation to come on. Well, you know, I have to tell people, Harvey, this. I want, I want to get into a little bit more. Um, you contacted me a while back and uh, had sent me a copy of the book, The Buddha from Babylon. And, and first of all, the name in itself uh, piqued my interest. And um, once you and I began kind of conversing back and forth. You had sent me also some links uh, in which I was able to view some conversations that you had had with some other people, some video conferencing or seminars, whatever you wish to call them, that you had also completed. Um, and it really struck me that this was some information that people really don't have any idea. We have, all of us have heard about the great Buddha. I mean, it's it's everywhere. But who is he really? Where did he come from? And, and how did this all begin? And I think that's probably the most important question here, Harvey, is we've got to have a place to start. So we'll, let's start with how we arrived at the Buddha. Well, the Buddha, uh, from a religious standpoint, is a, uh, a figure that has become synonymous with uh, divinity uh, across Asia for some 2,000 to 2,500 years. Uh, and uh, uh, the religion that has grown around him, which is Buddhism, uh, has a multitude of variations that have developed uh, in various countries in Asia uh, since the life of the man who uh, has the title of Buddha. That man was a person 2,500 years ago, born in 563 BC, that's about 500 years or so, uh, before uh, Jesus, and at that time uh, the legend of his life says that he was born in India and uh, I think many people are familiar with the traditional uh, legend of the, of the uh, biography of the Buddha. Uh, in terms of Buddhism, uh, as Buddhism uh, developed over hundreds and a uh, couple of thousand years, it moved uh, into various countries across uh, Asia, primarily the eastern part of Asia. When I say east, I mean east of what is today um, the, the edge of the Islamic uh, 
uh, countries of Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is where the Indus Valley is. And in uh, these uh, old days, uh, the question is, is very difficult to answer as to where exactly did this person, Siddhartha Gautama, where was he born, uh, where did he live, where is the original teachings of his come from because there's so many variations on that theme of Buddhism that occurred uh, during the time after his lifetime. So uh, my book, uh, The Buddha from Babylon, uh, is uh, based on about 15 years of research and basically a lifetime of exploring what Buddhism is about. And uh, that research uh, led me to places that I never really imagined, uh, connections with uh, researchers, archaeologists, linguists uh, in, in Asia, uh, a, a thorough study of the mythological language of Buddhism in trying to act like a detective to find out who exactly was this person, Siddhartha Gautama, and why is it that we consider him to be this figure uh, that is usually thought of as a, a trend, one of transcendent wisdom? And then, finally, what was his enlightenment? Uh, a question that is very difficult to answer, uh, even among Buddhists, uh, because the usual answer is, well, you have to be enlightened to understand what enlightenment is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that would actually be pretty much of a true statement, is how do you explain it to somebody, right? Um, okay, so my question to you is, because my curiosity is up, and I'm sure others are as well, um, when you did the research on his original... Um, I guess collation of information that he used in order to bring Buddhism forward um, and of course our modern-day Buddhism and of course all the variances but we're gonna kinda try to keep it in more of a, a, a tighter knit row here if we can what is the big significant difference of the original I guess teachings, if you will, of this man that we've come to know as Buddha, as opposed to what it has become today. Well, that was exactly the question I wanted to find out. Uh, it is um, it is a difficult question because basically uh, Buddhism has a variety of starting points. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism uh, started perhaps around the 9th century uh, BCE, which is the same as AD. Uh, Chinese Buddhism began uh, sometime around the 2nd and 3rd century BCE, again AD. Both of those uh, perhaps account for uh, a great many of the believers today, plus we have Buddhism in Southeast Asia, uh, we have Buddhism in Sri Lanka off of India, we have Buddhism uh, that developed in Korea and Japan. Uh, so uh, there are all of those types of Buddhism all had to adapt to the cultures that they landed in. Uh, and primarily much of Buddhism resulted in, in all of that because it was chased out of India. As uh, Hinduism uh, took charge uh, around the same time as, uh, as the birth of uh, Jesus uh, on the other end of Asia, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism at that point uh, competed for attention in India. And uh, one of the criticisms that Hinduism had for Buddhism was that it was a foreign religion, that it came from somewhere else, and that uh, Hinduism uh, and its 
New Testament, which was the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, basically had an Old Testament version uh, that is the Vedic teachings that go back to a time even before Buddhism. So the argument in, in India, uh, and this would be around the second and third century at the time when India was uh, experiencing a golden age under the Gupta regime, the argument against Buddhism was that basically the Buddha was just another figure in the totality of their pantheon. Uh, and that basically everything that Buddhism says can uh, is just a, a spin-off of, uh, of Hinduism. Uh, and therefore, uh, in response to that, the Buddhists at that time said, oh no, we're, we're local, we're right from here. And they made every effort to write uh, the teachings and the sutras, which is the Buddhist literature um, of Buddhism, to make it sound as if it was local to India in order to be accepted. Over time, unfortunately or fortunately, that did not work. And, uh, and the Buddhists were chased out of India by Hindus and then later by the Islamic invasion of India. So, therefore, we could say that there are relatively few Buddhists that remained in India uh, after that particular point. So where did Buddhism go? Uh, it went south to Sri Lanka and then from there into Southeast Asia and this is called the Theravada Buddhist uh, uh, category and, the, and then it also went north and northeast through China, Korea and then Japan. So that is called the Mahayana stream of Buddhism. So over this period of diaspora for Buddhism, obviously there had to take place some adaptation. So the question that you asked is, well, what was the starting point? And in order to look at that, uh, I've had to look at the entirety of Buddhism, all of its teachings, and try to decipher from it what was modified and adapted and what could be said to be the original teachings of the Buddha himself, Siddhartha Gautama, because what he said was not recorded at the time that he lived. Uh, it was memorized uh, in an oral teachings that was later written down. So you have to ask the question, would anybody dare want to change what he said, uh, maybe at the edges? but that a good portion of what is recorded in the Buddhist literature is of such depth and profundity that it basically illustrates what his enlightenment was, what did he see in his cosmic visions, what did he understand about the human mind and its connection with the universe, and what was the grand field of existence that he saw and as a result when you start reading uh, the Buddhist literature from that standpoint you get a fabulous fabulous uh, look at what appears to be almost a scientific view of existence in fact it's probably even uh, Postmodern in certain respects, in terms of what it, what the, uh, and I'm saying science in quotes, what the science of it is about, and I'll share some of that with you with your audience as uh, we go on to this. Oh, I would absolutely love that. Now, see, that is you just ticked my box. You just clicked my box right there when you said that. The scientific view of you know how this world works, how everything works. Absolutely fantastic, fantastic. Um, so I was sitting there listening. I kind of want to back up a little bit. I was listening to how you were wording all of that when you were talking about taking all of the different components of the original, well, what you assume is mostly the original text from the oral traditions, and then, of course, then taking into consideration the different locations in which uh, it also stemmed from and then trying to weed that out in order to get to 
the heart of the matter, right? I I have no idea how your little brain could have functioned like that. That is just no wonder it took you so long to do this. I mean, I mean, this must have just been such a powerful journey for you to get that immersed into these teachings into the cultures into the past uh, all the way up into the present and the mindset and the expanded view oh my um, my hats off to you Harvey my hats off to you sir for sure that's that's just fantastic so getting to that why don't you begin in that last segment section which we just talked about and if you could maybe I guess uh, approach it um, in steps which you're very good at um, to show us what his cosmological view was scientific view was of how all things are connected in as far as the spiritual aspect and the scientific aspect I'll be happy to I think a good place to start is to basically come to terms with Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha as an individual uh, which is difficult to do sometimes because uh, in the days in which uh, Buddhism was written is almost the same time as the Gospels are written uh, about Jesus and the uh, style at that time was to create uh, supernatural beings out of the founders of the religion. Uh, so the legend about the Buddha is equally uh, supernatural. Uh, there is a, a birth story um, that basically said he, he jumped out of his mother's womb uh, and landed on his two feet and was uh, immediately engaging. Uh, so uh, we, we know that these are legends and we we have to understand that the language of religion from before we see religion as institutional religion but the language of theologians who uh, essentially recorded any religion at its inception uh, are using a mythological language full of symbolism and parables and what they're doing is they're trying to capture wisdom and they're trying to not tell us something that we would understand from a factual standpoint but something that we would understand as if we were dreaming it because hmm. our minds themselves they understood the uh, the way that the human mind worked, that the human mind spoke in this language of symbolism and metaphor at its deepest root, uh, including the, the unconscious mind. And it is uh, part of the appearance of, of the Buddha is, is that he emerges within an already existing tradition of seers. And those seers, uh, in particular, were called the Arya. Arya means lion. Uh, lion um, sun seers were the original Arya. They can be seen earlier in history in Egypt, in Sumer, Akkad, and throughout the civilized world because they were among the first to start any religion at all. Uh, they, their literature uh, is the literature of metaphor. If you look at the very oldest literature that we have ever found, which is the epic story of Gilgamesh uh, that right. takes place in uh, Sumer, which is 5,000 years ago, it is a brilliant, brilliant uh, metaphor and story with all kinds of fantastic implications regarding wisdom. Uh, so consequently, we have to ask ourselves, how is it that the literature is so sophisticated even compared to today in terms of, of its 
uh, mental, emotional, and universal scope at the very beginning of civilization? The answer to that is that the spiritual work is even older than civilization itself. That by the time civilization begins, we are already well underway in terms of having a very, very sophisticated mythological language. And it is not a language of fantasy, as many of us think today. It is not necessarily even a language of divinity in many cases. What it is, is a language of embedded wisdom. Embedded wisdom that is uh, received by virtue of visionary connection. This is a skill that the ancient seers worked very hard for thousands of years to develop. The pipeline uh, that uh, is known as the Axis Mundi, which is the, uh, the pipeline for visionary connection, is the one that they used to see beyond the plane uh, of this existence to the worlds above and the worlds below. And they came back with descriptions that are then uh, communicated through uh, mythological language. And so by the time the Buddha comes, and he is also a member of the Arya tradition, by the time he comes, uh, there is already a very, very powerful uh, group of teachers that he can uh, turn to, uh, which he does in his youth, uh, and does from the very beginning uh, learn how to be a seer, uh, and then he attempts to do something which the seers have always said somebody, one of us, is going to do, which is the achievement of what they called enlightenment. And enlightenment in their language meant the ability to use vision uh, to such a degree that one pierces the boundless scope of existence and sees it all. And this is called the truth of the reality of all existence in ancient uh, li literature. And today we call it the theory of everything. Okay. I forgot to unmute my mic there. Sorry. Um, wow. Um, those were That's extremely profound. I'm sure you already know that. I'm sure you, you, uh, you certainly understand what you just shared with everybody because I know that I felt that from an extreme level. Um, so let me ask you a personal question here. When you began doing this research and studying, were you on a spiritual quest or were you on a literary quest? Uh, I was on both. Okay. I had uh, I had decided um, I would say sometime around uh, 1995 to write a small 30-page booklet that will communicate to my children what it is I'd been doing for some 25 years at that point in terms of trying to understand <laughs> Buddhism. And I decided I was going to write a little booklet and just hand, give it to them so that they could, you know, have that uh, as a treasure. And uh, eventually it turned into uh, the Buddha from Babylon. Wow, what a fascinating tale that you would do something so wonderful for your children, first of all. So um, is it because you are a Buddhist yourself that you wanted to find out more about it? Or were you just interested in Buddhism? It was like a, I call it the compelling force. And um, many of us have a compelling force, and we, we don't know why we do what we do. It's just that that just feels right. And then when we get involved in it, we go, it is right for us, for the individual, right? And it becomes greater than even our original thought of how it was going to unfold. And obviously, by this book, I'm sure you're. <laughs> your uh, journey into all of this um, 
became way bigger than what you originally anticipated, as in your story of the 30 pages ended up being this 500-plus page The Buddha from Babylon book. Yes. Um, I, I would say that uh, I uh, started uh, practicing Buddhism in 1968 uh, at the time when uh, our country was in upheaval. And uh, it was also uh, the year in which uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Robert Kennedy were assassinated, as well as Malcolm X. And I had turned 18, and at the same time, uh, the United States government decided to uh, create a draft lottery to make it fair uh, so that uh, everyone can be part of the Vietnam War effort and be drafted, uh, not based on your uh, wealth or your education. Uh, and uh, I think I was fortunate to have uh, my number come up too high to be taken to Vietnam. And I was wondering, under those circumstances, what is it that made me so lucky as to not to have to go while uh, my friend... Uh, you know, across the hallway, uh, he, he uh, was drafted and went to Vietnam. So the question for me was uh, really the, the quest for me in terms of my original interest in Buddhism is the understanding of destiny which led to an understanding of the uh, concept of Buddhism called karma. Okay, well, you know, that's a whole story. Everything you just said there is a whole story in and of itself. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, this is so much fun. I have to tell you, Harvey, this is fun. Um, before I forget, and I know that Brian has done this for us, but if anybody has any uh, specific questions that they would like to ask Harvey tonight um, in the chat room, please do place your questions in all cap letters so that he can see them and send them to us and as soon as we get them we'll try to weave them into the conversation uh, so that uh, Harvey can answer any questions that you might have tonight so again place your questions all in caps in the chat box and then um, Brian will forward those to us uh, during the show um, I was also remiss in the very beginning of telling people that tonight may be a shorter than a two-hour show. Um, I have a uh, an injury that is uh, creating a, a little bit of uh, un discomfort for me, So, which is the reason why I'm not on video is because I'm moving around, I'm standing up, and I'm sitting down, and it becomes pretty disconcerting for people to watch that. So I just opted to turn the video off tonight for everyone. Uh, so that they could focus on my guest tonight, which is Harvey Kraft, uh, the author of The Buddha from Babylon. Um, so I now have remembered everything I was supposed to say, Harvey. <laughs> so we'll get back to it. So my apologies for kind of interrupting the flow there. All right, so we have um, we have a lot of lost history in in the Buddha. The Buddha was a man. He was a flesh and blood man. Um, that must have had, um, I call it again, that, that compelling force within him to, to be something different <clears throat> and, to, and to be, um, um, I guess, upfront with it, you know, out in the public, sharing it. Um, and I would assume with you, in the, and I was in those times too, by the way, in the 1960s and 70s when we were in Vietnam. I remember that very well, what was going on in this country and, and all of that. And um, the warring, um, the pain, and, and all of that was, was a lot for this country on top of all the demonstrations. And we had a lot going on in this country, a lot of the wonderful people that were uh, killed, assassinated in this country uh, during those same very turbulent times and people did try to seek and some found a softer, gentler side of life that they chose to follow as opposed to what everybody else was following which was the the upheaval, the chaos and, and, and the warring kind of mindset which is really I think uh, a lot of the young people don't really understand what happened in those days in this country 
um, it was across this country. Um, it was really extreme times for what had ever transpired in our quote unquote modern history. So for you to seek that out, I, I would assume it's because there was an unsettling, you were unsettled, and you call it karma, but now I'm talking to you from your personal viewpoint besides the bigger picture here, right? The bigger picture is is that I think we're driven and compelled to do things because it's something that is part of our, you called it destiny. And I, I think this is something that we choose to do and then we get an opportunity and we follow it and it, it broadens for us. And in this case, obviously this journey for you into Buddhism uh, continued on and, and just absolutely got extraordinarily huge uh, in its inception as well as all the information that you must have ascertained along the way. Um, and not meaning to take up all this time with sharing that information, but I, I kind of wanted to put it into a frame for you that this is really an extremely bit of profound work for also for the listeners out there and the viewers. Um, this is profound work. So starting from the point of your younger days and, and seeking out something of a gentler nature compared to what was going on in the country overall, um, it led you to this spot that you're here today. So there's there obviously no accident, right? Um, what was the biggest thing in regards to the lost history of all of this when you were researching it that you were kind of astounded by because we don't get to hear um, a lot of the real history behind anything that we've been taught anymore. Oh, <clears throat> that's a good question. I, I hear I hear the uh, the general complaint about um, our view of history uh, rather uh, often uh, and it, it, it's really easily explained by virtue of, uh, as we all know, uh, who writes the history and why. And in most cases, uh, even today in our academic environments, we study the history of the powerful and their armies and who invaded who and who dominated who for how long and how much brutality that they use in order to achieve that, and how much corruption was in the world, and who was corrupted, and uh, who fought who and why. Uh, and much of what we have as evidence for history uh, is usually unearthed anywhere from uh, pottery to, uh, to weapons. Uh, and so what I saw uh, in history in that regard was a big gaping hole which is uh, an understanding that so much of history was actually driven by spiritual people and I'm not talking about just people who were heads of religion I'm talking about those who made the effort to use the human mind to understand uh, what existence was all about, whether they saw gods or God or angels or uh, understood the psychological aspect of it, most of what uh, was created and later morphed into religion uh, were visionary notions of existence. Uh, by virtue of the fact that we even have ver such visionary notions means that the human mind had evolved to the point of having a conceptual depth uh, that was very, very advanced in the past and uh, in many ways is less advanced today other than I would say the advancement of the human mind today is being used in terms of what we do with science and technology. Now, if you want to look back, and I'm getting to your question here, you want to look back at what were the influences on the man who became the Buddha, 
what I discovered that was so startling that I really refused to believe it for some long period of time was that he actually uh, went to Babylon uh, and then after that, after a period of some 15 to 17 years there, returned to, uh, to the Indus Valley and that's when Buddhism begins. Uh, this chapter does not exist in Buddhism. It is a, uh, a dramatic departure from the notion that the Buddha attained enlightenment in total isolation. Huh. My premise is that not only was he a great seer, but he was the most brilliant educated man in the world who when he went to Babylon, uh, if you look at Babylon specifically during his lifetime, what you see there is the order of the Magi who were the leaders of the creation of algebraic mathematics. They created the zodiac uh, in terms of their cosmological observations. They, uh, they were seers. They were uh, also very educated to the history of the world because they were based in the Arya tradition of the seers. And so consequently, uh, oh, by the way, the, the Jews had been exiled to uh, Babylon uh, just before he got there for 75 years. And there were Greeks there and Jews there and Indians there. It was really the New York of its day. It was <laughs> the most cosmopolitan center of the world. And unfortunately, our memory of it has been stained uh, for religious and political uh, reasons but it was also the most fiercely independent, always fighting for freedom uh, place in the world and one that drew uh, the uh, heads of religion and seers from all over the world to that one place and he specifically the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama became the chief of the Magi and uh, led that the effort there uh, for some period of time until a coup by the Persians uh, forced him to flee and it was also a purge of the Magi order at the same time. My point is just this, that when he went back to the Indus Valley uh, where India begins, he went back as a man who had already been uh, a king, uh, the head of the Magi, the most brilliant man in the world, uh, one who totally understood uh, the ramifications of wisdom and knowledge and it is there and then that he breaks through to the ultimate level of enlightenment and begins to teach Buddhism. Huh. All right. Uh, wow. Uh, I would imagine that was probably uh, pretty mind-blowing. And for people out there listening, um, I think hence comes the title of your book, The Buddha from Babylon. Um, interesting. Interesting that that's where um, he probably had his greatest um, breakthroughs in some sense. And, you know, him being driven out then took him to the next step, which is to teach that, to try to give back to the people that which he had attained. No matter if they attained to the same level or not, he at least opened the door. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Oh my goodness. I'd love to hear more about the Magi. Um, that was an interesting order. Um, and, you know, it's sad in some ways, Harvey, when you were telling the story, how many times have we heard that story but with different names? Uh, great, great leaders, great people. Um, and they get thrown out because somebody else decides that they shouldn't be there, right? And yet they, they still persevere. These are the great, great people of, of our history. And we don't hear about those. You're right. We hear more about the, the generals and the, you know, the presidents and the prime ministers and all that stuff that, you know, and kings and queens, but they, they weren't the, the spiritual people. They weren't the, 
leaders of consciousness and and goodness, if you will, you know. So what a shame. Um, but I think it's really. Um, I, I really don't think that this has been uh, a journey for you that's even completed yet. I still think there's more for you to be doing with this. I'm not quite sure what that means, but that's what that feels like to me is that there's still more for you, I guess, to understand. And I guess through the years of studying this, it's like having a download and it takes you a while to sort it all out. And the older you get, the more wise and connected you get, right? So I think your journey has certainly got a ways to go yet before you're completely done. I'd love to see when you have your next book out. <laughs> Just saying. Um, that being said, let's go to let's let's go to the idea here of the technological and scientific views that were presented. Uh, yeah, that were presented. I think that would be the best way to go for this moment. And then maybe we'll come back and visit the uh, idea of the other portion of that, which is the more spiritual side of that scientific information. All right. Um, in all, uh, in 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 understanding the Buddha, or the story of anyone, if you're going to write a biography about anyone, you really have to have a scope of past, present, and future. And so the Buddha from Babylon uh, starts out essentially with an understanding of the roots of religion themselves. What is this notion that we have about having a visionary capability to see uh, beyond uh, the end of our nose? Uh, that is explored through the various civilizations and cultures that came before the Buddha so that the reader could better understand how the Buddha saw history from his uh, point uh, of living, which was 2,500 years ago, because there was about a 2,000-year history prior to him appearing that has its influence on him. My point was that really any religion uh, is, uh, starts on the basis of some religious influences that precede it. In the case of Buddhism, the influences are both Eastern and Western. Uh, m most uh, Asians believe that the influences on Buddhism were just Eastern influences of the Brahmins and the Rig Veda and so on. And uh, what I've shown is that really Babylon uh, is, was the center of the world and all religions east and west flow out of Babylon in one form or another. Uh, you can really uh, get uh, a better understanding of that by reading the book uh, because the book is not strictly about uh, just the Buddha even though it all builds to that. So the second part, which was his present, was his quest uh, to un have this uh, global understanding. And then the third part was that he then teaches his enlightenment. And what is that enlightenment? Uh, I said uh, uh, to you earlier that uh, when, when people ask uh, Buddhists, uh, what is enlightenment, uh, the usual answer is, well, you have to be enlightened to understand enlightenment. Uh, but that said, and I'm not saying that uh, any answer to that question actually makes you enlightened, uh, but there is definitely uh, a scope of enlightenment, an essence and a nature to enlightenment that is recorded in Buddhist literature. And uh, I chose to create um, a uh, organization of the Buddhist teachings uh, which comes through in this book that I call the Four Cosmologies of Existence. Of those four cosmologies, I'll list them first and then we'll go through them. Wonderful. The first one is the cosmology of infinite wisdom in which the Buddha basically uh, shows through mythological vision the Big Bang 
creation of the universe. The second uh, of those is essentially uh, the cosmology of the, the fields of existence in which uh, the Buddha describes that all of existence has an under structure, uh, a scaffolding that is composed of form, formlessness, and desire. The third cosmology is the Buddha's theory of relativity in which he reveals that uh, nothing can exist separate from anything else, that everything in existence is relative to something else. And yet, paradoxically, at the core and essence of existence is a state that he calls void of relativity. You may have heard of it as the emptiness. It is not space. It is a dimension, essentially, where relatively, relativity does not apply. The laws of relativity, time, space, scale, and dimension uh, no longer function at this uh, ultimate core of existence. And the fourth of his cosmologies, which is called the Lotus Cosmology, is an actual entrance through the portal of what he calls the perfectly endowed reality. In other words, you are now leaving the, uh, the universe of relativity uh, and you are going into uh, this essence uh, where there is no relativity and there you will discover what is called the Buddha land or the land of enlightenment and it is in that space, place or whatever you want to call it uh, that he reveals the scope uh, and the origin of enlightenment. And that is basically uh, the, uh, the Buddhist enlightenment part of this book. In it uh, there are definitely uh, discoveries uh, of evidence that there are influences on that vision that are um, similar to uh, symbols and parables that had been found uh, in Sumerian, Egyptian, even Judean uh, literature, as well as Brahmanic and Rig Deva literature. And even more surprising is that in these cosmologies, uh, he offers uh, certain parables and theological thoughts that are uh, perhaps uh, the fundamental views that are held uh, in the Christian thought. Wow. Okay. So go back to number one. Share that again, if you will. All right. Okay. Number one is uh, this uh, story uh, of the vision of the Buddha in which he sees uh, into far, far space and that in the center of this space there is a giant colossal Buddha figure seated on a lotus flower and light bursts from this Buddha whose name is Virachana which means uh, Universal Radiance Buddha. As a result of this light that emerges from him, there uh, are other light-bearing Buddhas that are then duplicated in billions and trillions of numbers, and each one becomes a light source. And so what this is is a mythological description of the Big Bang Theory as we see it from a scientific point of view. It is the emergence of the universe and the formation of stars. What the difference is from a spiritual standpoint is that the Buddha is saying that this is purposeful, not mechanical. That it is the Buddhas that appear from the dimension uh, uh, that is free of relativity and the decision to enter uh, into the field of form 
by uh, creating the universe uh, such that there would then be space and place for life to evolve. This is their purpose, and this is how Buddhism begins. Mm. Very similar to what I was shown, of course, I'm not Buddhist, but a, a very similar vision uh, didn't come from a Buddha, but the all the components are there for what you know what our scientists call the Big Bang theory. Okay, so I'm that's what fascinates me about this is 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 that a whole uh, just just to add to that uh, for a moment, we're talking about a vision that is two thousand five hundred years old and one that is uh, not uh, accessed through technology. Right, exactly. It is access through the human mind. So right. what this means, what, what the, the implication is that we, human beings, have within us the capacity to extend our, the scope of our consciousness well beyond what we even imagine it to be. We're not talking about ESP, we're not talking about long distance viewing in terms of seeing to another spot on Earth. We're talking right. about telescopic vision that extends uh, back to the beginning of time right. and to the beginning of the universe and yet in some way is actually outside of it. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay, so second one. Move to that one. Okay, uh, that one is basically uh, done through a description of Nirvana, which is the Buddhist heaven. And uh, it is, uh, without getting into all the symbolism, I'll try to just say that what it is basically saying is that the universe itself and everything in it is composed of these three fields, form, formlessness, and desire, and just if you look at a human being, uh, that pretty much explains us all. <laughs> pretty much, in a nutshell, it does. In a nutshell. And yeah. so he's saying everything in existence is explained by these three uh, factors, and right. they are integrated. They are inseparable from one another. Uh, desire here uh, is basically the prime mover. It is, uh, it, 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 certainly we all know, that if you had no desire, the first thing that would happen is you would be catatonic. Right. Uh, you would. Uh, you wouldn't move, uh, and and you wouldn't be born because your parents wouldn't have any desire, uh, so nothing would happen, and including time wouldn't move. Right. Uh, so desire here is is a word that should be understood on on a much grander scale as uh, another word for the impelling force. Uh, that then turns formless into form and form into formless. So, for example, if you have an idea, uh, your idea is in the formless state, but you can then convert that idea into a manifestation uh, in the real world and create form out of that idea. Also, whatever is form uh, eventually deteriorates and is transient and returns to its uh, formless or potential state. Um, so the universe itself as a structure uh, has a field uh, of formlessness where potential and memory exist and this is, this is the area that then uh, uh, connects with form and we are always connected to that formless uh, existence and we use our desire in order to move uh, from form state or form mind, uh, formless mind to uh, to a form state and back and forth. Um, yeah, that's uh, when you stop and think about uh, all of that in in the way that you presented it, as well as the first uh, first one. It gets a, a, a larger picture than what most people. Do normally think about during their day and I think that's the whole point behind the work that you do is to make people to think bigger more than what they would have with using the same words that you just used 
because they use them all day every day right these are words but when you put them in the context and in the space if you will of where your presentation they become bigger more meaningful they become more in depth more profound love it love it so, Number th so go it's, ahead. A, it's actually uh, you know Buddhism um, is about um, uh, Buddhism is, is about addressing uh, the suffering of individual and suffering is sometimes uh, a, a, a difficult word for for us to uh, believe about ourselves uh, that we are all suffering beings uh, but from the standpoint of Buddhism what he's really talking about is that we have anxieties and we have conflicts and we have a whole bunch of issues which exist in our relative world and so when what, what I, I'm trying to make people aware of is that not only do they have an individual mind and a collective or shared mind with other people, but they also have a universal mind. Now, whether you use it or not is another story. Uh, and so the universal mind is your path to a higher level of consciousness. And if you understood that, uh, that when your universal mind and your collective and individual mind are in perfect balance with one another, uh, rather than being... Uh, say if you're all individual mind you tend to rather be selfish uh, in your uh, ways of looking at things if you're uh, you know pretty much a, a co collective kind of person you tend to be a, a movement person uh, who, who is part of a group think whether it be a corporation or a political or social movement uh, but the universal mind is one in which uh, creates a much higher consciousness of your uh, yourself uh, and and really is the path to knowing who you really are and your true self and th this is what the Buddha is trying to do he's trying to use uh, this revelation of cosmic uh, infrastructure uh, or whatever however you want to describe it uh, as a something that is omnipresent both in each and every person's mind as well on a grand scale outside of them. Uh, consequently, you have a sense of uh, lifting human beings to a level of consciousness that supersedes their suffering, uh, and this is what is meant in Buddhism by deliverance. Love it. Love it. I think I need to look up some more Buddhism stuff. Um, I used to study it a long time ago. Well, there, um, there's a book you might want to start uh, reading. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, it's called The Buddha from Babylon. Ah, yes, I have read part of it. I didn't get through all of it. I have to be very honest with you, Harvey. Yeah, I didn't get through all of it. It's it's a lot. Um, yeah. It's one of those where you you start reading it and then you let it digest. Yes. And then you go back and you read some more and then you let it digest. Um although it does read a little bit like a mystery novel as well and you really want to turn the pages but you just can't because you're you're filled for yeah, the I've moment that, uh, I've been told that it makes your brain leak out of your ears <laughs> that wouldn't be far from the truth I can tell you <laughs> I love it um, where were we at we at number three or number four I think we're at three alright so go forward uh, the easy answer, uh, quantum physics, um, where uh, relativity uh, no longer applies and there's a whole other set of rules. So we already know that's the case. And where do you find it? You find it in the microcosm of existence. So the Buddhism, Buddha is saying it's in the essence. If you were uh, to dive into the core of existence, into its very essence, and go smaller and smaller and smaller you come out the the other side and the other side of that is outside of the field of form right and therefore you are now in what is essentially the, the uh, formless dimension with which uh, is uh, connected to form but which transcends form and the reason why we know that that's what he's talking about is 
there are various descriptions in the literature. Uh, he might say, um, he might describe, for example, uh, that um, that uh, the entire universe is populated with Buddhas, and uh, they all have uh, celestial bodhisattvas uh, working with them. Uh, their purpose is to uh, move forward the consciousness uh, evolution of beings throughout the universe. And uh, in this uh, perfectly endowed reality that they are all able to enter, they can meet and communicate. And okay. it is in that uh, realm uh, that's called the Buddha land uh, is where, uh, for example, he's described that uh, it might take a few billion years for all of them to come together in terms of real time, but it takes about an hour in that particular dimension. Hmm. Now, what he's really doing ultimately is saying and revealing that all beings, including all of us human beings, uh, are really enlightened beings who have, rather than sit, essentially sit on their duff and enjoy how enlightened they are, uh, have made a conscious decision to be born into the field of form in the universe, a universe, any universe, because there are multiverses in Buddhism, and in the process, uh, accept the veil of mortality at birth, so consequently there's no memory. And this is all part of a journey to rediscover uh, your original enlightenment and your essentially uh, everlasting quest to uh, create uh, a harmonious and wise universe. Love it. Sounds right. Sounds right. So that's who we are, and so uh, this requires, of course, a, an enlightened recognition of your true self, and part of what Buddhism offers uh, is a way in which you can uh, find the skills to develop uh, that consciousness. Uh, I don't um, uh, promote any Buddhism. Uh, I don't promote any particular practice. Uh, my, my point of view is that we are all perfectly endowed with enlightenment and wherever you are and whatever you are, uh, I believe that what we owe to ourselves is to explore uh, what we are capable of. And if you and your life are starting to explore what you're capable of and, and bring forth the potential and do so in a heartfelt, compassionate way, uh, you certainly are acting already in an enlightened manner. Correct. Absolutely. That was beautifully said, Harvey. Thank you so much for that. Um, number four. That was number four. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought we were on number three. My bad. Yeah, you moved right in from the number three to the number four. Number four so we you went did. From, yep. from that relativity to uh, to the void of relativity. So my thoughts is are, are on this rather. Um, my thoughts are um, that we're we're all on this journey and that we're always more than what we think we are. We have to express ourselves, or, or I call it the authentic self. This is a terminology I use: is finding the authentic self, which is the true self, and working. And I use working in the term work in a in a in a, a great way. I don't consider it a bad word. I consider it a good word. I'm working, right? I'm doing something. I'm 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 involved with something that makes me feel good it's my work whether it's spiritual enlightenment or whatever the case may be right so as we're all of us are journeying through this life hence the name of my show it's it's the destination isn't about 
the destination in the now time so much as it is the journey of where do we go how much do we potential do we grab for ourselves how much do we grow how much as you said compassion and awareness and enlightenment can we continue to work on within ourselves I think when a person is like that Harvey when you meet people like that they have a, a an energy about them um, a, a signal if you will that they give off that causes other people to be attracted to them in a sense and wanting to know more about them their own selves in their own life it becomes a joint effort although we're alone we're not we're all interconnected and I love the first part that you said about that nothing can be all by itself and sustain itself you, when you when you think about that and you put a tree somewhere anywhere just set it out in space well it doesn't have any ground so it can't grow its roots it doesn't have any water so it can't feed itself and when you look at the symbiotic symbiotic relationship between a tree and grass and what some people call weeds they all rely on each other for survival they all communicate with each other for survival it's we don't hear it but it's there and humans are the same way if you put one human somewhere and there's nothing else think about that I want people to think about the depth of that if it's just one thing and there's nothing else it can't survive we are all in this together so it's about raising each other up and helping each other and you do that through the your works of your book um, your talks that you give um, you have some videos as well on your website the Buddha from Buddha from Babylon dot com um, not the Buddha but Buddha from Babylon dot com I want to repeat that um, for people um, I want uh, what I would love for t for you to do at this time uh, for us Harvey's I'm I'm getting more and more uncomfortable as I'm sitting here and I'm having a hard time concentrating I'm sure you probably uh, can sense that I would love for you though to share uh, another idea okay there is a question that came in what does Harvey think compassion is would you like to explain what you think compassion is sure um, compassion is a word that we try to use to describe uh, the act of caring it's uh, something we're all capable of uh, and unfortunately some of us um, develop conditions that uh, shut it off at it at in in some ways in in the Christian religion uh, the word that's used is love uh, in both cases whether it's Buddhist compassion Christian love or any other religion or any other way that people want to talk about it the the actual full uh, aspect uh, of it is the word selflessness it's selfless compassion it is selfless love uh, it does not require a reward it is a desire to do for others because all beings are expressions of life and it is life that is at the center of everything it's so true beautiful beautiful thank you for that um, so what I'd love for you to do now though is to maybe is to give some ideas uh, to take a, uh, anything that you would like and to uh, talk about it a little bit before uh, I'm gonna let you go for tonight um, but I would like to revisit another conversation with you after the first of the year if that's possible I'd love to get back with you and we'll get into this way more in depth than we, we can tonight. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the audience would enjoy an encore presentation now that they have an introduction uh, to this and we can get into some more complex thoughts and some more history, some more fun stuff as well because it's all fun in my opinion. It's all good. Um, so 
if you would, I would love for you just to just to take whatever it is that you would like to share um, and take as long as you need and um, just talk about what it is that you would like to leave the audience with tonight before we hopefully can get you back on. I appreciate that um, uh, opportunity. I would say that uh, the first thing uh, I want to do right here is uh, uh, exploit the opportunity that you gave me by holding up my book, which is uh, the Buddha from Babylon. Uh, it has a golden lion on the picture. And this gives me the opportunity to say that uh, uh, rather than putting a uh, picture of a Buddha, uh, and incidentally the Buddha himself uh, was, was, not, uh, was not one who would approve having images of himself being worshipped. Uh, so it's ironic uh, that, uh, uh, that his brand uh, uh, is so iconic in regards to the image uh, of him. Uh, and there are so many different images of him uh, that have been created as art uh, and, and worshipful art uh, over time. And so what I'm trying to do is uh, bring back a understanding of the Buddha as a person, not a statue. Uh, and the reason for that is that he is so, so brilliant uh, and is a model for all of us as to the brilliance uh, of what we're all capable of. And that's his message to us. He's not saying, I did it, uh, I'm immortal and you're not, uh, I'm uh, saved and you're not. Uh, his whole teaching is based on, let me take you where I'm at. Now, um, that said, uh, people don't always recognize the person who comes along and, and wants to do something for others. Uh, we've seen uh, plenty of examples, uh, still seeing it today in the world, of uh, people who, when they want to do good, are the first to be persecuted, uh, usually because they're a threat to some uh, uh, authority or establishment or domination. Uh, so the same was true uh, for the story of Siddhartha Gautama uh, in regards to what happened in Babylon. Uh, we didn't cover that in, in this uh, particular program, uh, but I'm sure we will in the next program. What I've done, though, is take that piece of history and his enlightenment, and I decided to write a follow-up book, which I'm nearly finished, and... Uh, it will be called The Waker, and it will be the first in a series. Uh, and uh, the, this particular first book of The Waker will be called uh, Portal of Perfect Light. Uh, and it will allow me, by virtue of uh, writing it as a sci-fi fantasy novel, uh, to communicate some of the thoughts and conclusions that I've personally arrived at uh, regarding what happened in Babylon and who the Buddha is and uh, what happened there in terms of the political takeover by the Persian Empire. Uh, and so uh, I'm trying to uh, communicate to as many people as possible through various uh, types of projects, including one uh, that will come next year that will be a documentary uh, on the Buddha from Babylon, uh, to try to get out the word. Uh, that uh, people can really appreciate the Buddha as an inspiration for what we're capable of uh, individually uh, and as a global humanity. Uh, and so our future uh, is not seen so much as something as a result of uh, uh, simply uh, technology or uh, something that will come to us from uh, outer space but rather it is up to us to really create such a beautiful uh, future for us that we can then communicate with all the other beautiful civilizations that have evolved uh, across the many universes. And that's it for me.
Oh my goodness, Harvey. Um, I, I'm just absolutely astounded. There's just, we, I, and I did not know you were writing a book, but I, um, I'm glad to hear that you are writing some books. <laughs> we definitely will have to get into that as well when we get you back, but I really do would like to have you back on and, and we will certainly chat about that. And then you can also give us an update on where you're at with your books and your documentary. How very exciting. Uh, for you, but also for all the listeners, the viewers, and the people that will be able to read the book and also watch your documentary. How fun is this? This is just awesome, uh, Harvey. I so appreciate it. Um, again, everyone, it's Buddha from Babylon.com. Please, 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 you owe it to yourself. Like I said, I started reading it. Uh, I've got it uh, partway done, and I need to go back and reread it or read some more of it, but I do highly recommend uh, the Buddha from Babylon. If nothing else, you get a piece of history. Uh, Harvey, you've just done such a marvelous job with um, the research uh, on on this whole uh, on Buddha and the times, and bringing in, as you said, the past, present, and future into the book itself. Uh, it's really important work. It's really important work because if nothing else, if if it's just somebody that's a history buff, right, reading your book, they're going to get something from it. But somebody who's on a path of, of discovery, of, of just wanting to expand their knowledge, uh, it's also a book for them. And people who are on a spiritual path are looking for some, some other concepts or something that they can relate to it's a book for them so you've you've covered the gamut for for most people in regards to this book and yes it's a it's a big book but the information in it is worth it for people to get into so I thank you for that um, Harvey and other than your website Buddha from Babylon is there any other um, way that you would like to is there a different way to get the book um, contact you are you wanting contact um, where do the, where do they go to purchase it well the easiest way to get the book is to go to Amazon uh, it's available there it's also available in other online stores um, and and it's available uh, only in English at this particular point but uh, there are people all over the world that uh, have ordered it and you can get it uh, either in print or in Kindle format um, so the other way also uh, in terms of your experience uh, in this regard is if you go to the website there is a contact uh, page and I more than welcome anybody's uh, questions or suggestions or views uh, there is information on that uh, website uh, regarding um, what other people think of it, excerpts, uh, videos, uh, radio shows, and so on. So there's quite a bit of content, and there's more to come. Oh, absolutely excellent, Harvey. Again, thank you so much for being with us, and I look forward to following up here with you in the next few weeks, and we'll get a date set uh, for you to return to the show. And I would like to remind everybody that uh, I have a couple of classes in December. I have one coming up uh, this Sunday. I have two spots left, so if you're interested, please do visit my website. That's journeyswithrebecca.com, and look under the classes and events page. Um, if you want, while you're there, you can also sign up for the newsletter. Be sure to to uh, sign up for the Twitter, uh, my Twitter feed, because that's where you get the last minute, up to the minute details on anything that's going on with the show, uh, events, guests, etc., and so forth as well. So I thank everyone for being here, and I do apologize again to everyone for the short length of the show tonight. Uh, I will be back next Tuesday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central Time, and Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. again. Please do check my website for the upcoming guests for next week. I look forward to it. But until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night.